Good day, Nick. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me. We're doing a transatlantic via Skype. It's good to hear from you, and um, I'm happy that the technology seems to be working well. Yes, it's always a good thing. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you grew up and where you went to college and what you studied? Sure. So um, my name is Nick Shackleton-Jones. Um, I'm Director of Learning Performance Innovation at PA Consulting, soon to be Deloitte. Um, and where did I grow up? So, yeah, I, I grew up in a small town called Newbury um, in south of England. Um, and I was packed off to, I say packed off, you know, I, 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 got, I won a place at um, what you call private school, we call public school. It's basically Harry Potter world. So uh, I went off to kind of prep school where we wear short trousers, lots of old buildings. Your whole life is run by ringing bells, all this kind of stuff. I went to, to prep school for a few years and then went on to a public school uh, in a town called Reading, where I was a boarder, meaning that I, I lived there full time. It's kind of like a military model. You know, you're in big dormitories. Um, it was almost all boys. There were kind of a few girls. And I was there for five years. Uh, it was a Quaker school. Uh, Quakers, if you don't know, they're kind of interesting. I wasn't a Quaker myself, but they spend a lot of time sitting in silence. Um, and so on a Thursday morning, we used to sit for uh, a couple of hours um, in silence. And the kind of spin on it was if you felt moved by the spirit to speak, you could get up in front of, you know, 400 people and just say, you know, what was what was on your mind. So um, it was interesting, a very kind of liberal, very... Uh, quirky set of individuals there a very international set of individuals there as well so yeah i, I went then to um i took a year out i did a bunch of different jobs um i then went to university of warwick in the middle of england um to study philosophy and psychology so that, that, that was how it worked i actually um did a, a swap in the middle year um and went to wisconsin so i was at madison wisconsin for a year um, and that was just a whole trip. I could probably spend the whole time talking about how wild that was for an English person to, to go and live in the U.S. for a year. Um, I, I ended up with a U.S. girlfriend, a girlfriend from Chicago, and we went back and forth and, and all kinds of things. Um, and then the final year back in the, the U.K., and then I went on to study my master's in philosophy. I studied particularly continental philosophy. And then I came out of that, um, and um, I had my first daughter. Um, and then I got my first proper job, which was a psychology lecturer. Um, and I did that uh, for five years, published some textbooks um, along the way. And then I went into industry and I worked for initially a consultancy called De Morgan Communications. And then I worked for, who did I work for? Siemens Communications. Um, that was in multimedia and learning. And from there on, I went to the BBC, where I was for five years, uh, and then BP for five years. And now I've been in consulting for four years. So that's the, you know, in a nutshell story. If any of that's interesting, then you, you can ask no. me more. But that's the, that's the story. That's very interesting. So how did you uh, go from uh, teaching philosophy to into a learning and development organization? What, what prompted that? Yeah, so... Um, Short answer, money. So I was, I was, a, I was a psychology lecturer, and, and actually it was, a, it was a great job. You, you get to, I was teaching roughly 50% adults. Um, uh, that was fascinating. The fact that adults were so hungry for knowledge, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been in that position, but there's a radical discontinuity. So you get a group of adults who are there for one day, and maybe, maybe working with adults with learning difficulties or whatever, and they are desperate for knowledge. They are there because they want psychology to give them some edge on, on their practice. And you get such energy from those sessions because they are pulling from you. It almost feels physically, you can feel them pulling. You know, what about this? What about this? What about this? And then you would go straight from that into a group of kind of surly teenagers, you know, 18, 19, who who just didn't want to know anything. They were just there because they had to be there. And you were pushing the whole time. You were trying to push content onto them and, and realizing the ineffectiveness of that. And so I guess even early on, it was an eye-opener to how much of learning is governed by what's really driving you know, the, the learner, you know, what their motivations are, I guess. Yes, and of course, that's central to your book, which we'll talk about in just a little while. Um, can you share with us a little bit about your first exposure to what I call HPT, human performance technology? Others might say evidence-based practice for 
performance improvement or some other name. What do you call it, and when did you first get exposed to this? <laughs> this is it's not perhaps the story that you might expect me to tell. So I was working um, at Siemens Communications, and I'd been a psychology lecturer. And my, my idea was that wouldn't the world be transformed if we could apply all of this kind of learning theory that, that I'd been teaching? And so I, I became a Flash developer. I hired a Flash development team. And in essence, the idea was if you put these two things together, all the learning theory and all the technology, you would do something absolutely transformational. And so we did. Um, and then what I discovered was, uh, and we did a small experiment, it makes no difference whatsoever. It, it, it just doesn't, you can, uh, and, and this should have been in a sense obvious to us, because at the same time I was doing this experimentation, um, the internet was blossoming, YouTube was happening, and incredibly, none of this was e-learning. And that, it never struck us in the profession as odd that actually e-learning, which we pretended to ourselves was this improved learning format, kind of just hadn't taken off at all. So instead, people were just using resources. They were just using short video and, and little guides. And I found that if I Googled um, the, the advice, uh, advice for having a difficult conversation, the number one thing that would come up on Google would be a checklist. And so something was going on in my head and I was thinking, hang on, we're doing all this stuff over here, this so-called educational stuff, and people kind of hate it. And people like Jane Hart were cataloging systematically how, how deeply people hated what we were doing. And over here, something amazing was happening on the Internet, which was just people finding helpful stuff. And so uh, initially I was a bit of a bystander as this was happening. Um, and then I moved out of, of Siemens and went to the BBC. And I noticed, because all of a sudden you're awash with UX people, people who are, are very user-centered in the design, and digital people, and marketing people. And what they were doing was, was fantastically well-loved, well-received. They had a lot of traction, but they were doing something completely different to us. They were doing user testing, user research, audience centricity. And so I started, you know, thinking, well, some of that might be kind of interesting to do. And we started producing resources and that's when this mantra resources not courses was born um, and for a while i think i was the resources not courses guy so i started talking about resources not courses now i'd come across people like bob Mosher, um, who were doing um, performance support but that at the time was very much restricted to it applications so at the time it meant you could talk to a company and they would buy this bit of software that would pop up little videos anytime you were stuck and this was more about like well couldn't you just develop resources for all aspects of life? You know, whenever I need help, the resource is just kind of right there. And so at the time at the BBC, that was when I started thinking about this kind of pit of high-end content, which was kind of push, um, uh, you know, courseware where we were getting a compliance message or a, a safety message across that... Um, then there would be some rapid development kind of content in the middle at the bottom. There would be lots of resources, and we would need to start to think of curation and, and uh, a content strategy. So I took this thinking into BP, and there I came across some other thinkers, Nigel Harrison, and he'd written a book called Performance Consulting, and I was heavily influenced. We had a number of conversations in, by that book, um, which really set out the importance of, hang on, before you, you build a course just stop and talk to people about what the real performance problem is and whether or not there's a simpler way to address that. It's a very powerful idea and it was reinforced, as I say, by what I'd already seen on the internet, but also Atul Gawande. Atul Gawande uh, wrote a book called The Checklist Manifesto and it, he really bolstered that argument by demonstrating that in a surgical context, a checklist was several times more powerful than a two-week training course. And, and so for me, it was kind of game, set, and match. If we really want to help people with performance, you know, we just need to do, be, start developing useful stuff and change our process and be user-centered. And so we had a lot of success with that approach at BP, which then kind of catapulted me into, um, you know, consulting roles. So, yeah, I can kind of go over the detail of that if you're interested, but that's sort of how it panned out. No, excellent. Thank you. And that is uh, a lead and overlaps with my next question, which is, some of your uh, biggest influencers in this approach, you know, people, articles, and books, and so you've mentioned several. So uh, if there's others, uh, because we're trying yeah. to point our audience to some resources, yeah. not courses, that, uh, <laughs> that, that they might follow up with uh, to help them on their journey 
to a more performance orientation, to an evidence-based set of practices, to, you know, to what really works. So yeah. any additional articles or books or people that might come to mind besides those that you've just mentioned? For sure. So um, Don Norman, The Design of Everyday Things. Um, this was a book that really influenced my thinking because it introduced me to the idea. He was really the, the father of design thinking um, and had influenced what Apple were doing. And, and the idea with Apple is just <laughs> user centricity. It's like, you know, stop pushing your designs at people. Really work with your audience for your audience, which is a, a phrase actually coined by my colleague Gemma Critchley while we were working at BP. So work with your audience for your audience in the design of things. Really understand what's going to help them. Um, and then work iteratively on designing a solution that, that meets their performance needs, that fits with their life and, and what they're trying to do. And that's a very alien concept. It sounds like common sense, but for education, I think a lot of what we do is tarnished by what we've experienced at school. And that's brutal. It's brutal in the sense that, you know, I don't give a stuff. You're a student. I don't care who you are, where you come from. Your job is to sit there, you know, shut up, take notes and, and pass the exam. And that's almost the opposite of user centricity. So I think very hard for many people in education to come away from that kind of basic model. So, so that was influential design of everything, everyday things. Jane Hart's been doing brilliant work for years and years and years, just really cataloging um, what d doesn't work. She does this voice of the learner survey year on year. And Jane and I have talked a few times and her survey, I think, has always helped me to understand what what the actual our, our customer what real people actually think of of what we're doing um she's kept us honest i think that's been um, quite powerful um so yes nigel harrison i mentioned um oh yeah clayton christensen sadly just recently passed away passed away um his focus on the job to be done you know what is it really your product or your service um it is doing and, and you're not going to know that unless you really work with people to discover it. So he's got a couple of YouTube lectures, but he gives a brilliant illustration of the role that a milkshake plays in people's lives. Um, and it's not what, what people think, um, but when you talk to them, you kind of understand what it needs to be. Um, so, yeah, just a, a, a few things that helped me. Excellent. Thank you for those. Let me uh, segue a bit here, um, as again, to provide an example to others that they may emulate, you know, adopt or adapt probably adapt. Uh, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, let's say that you're at a neighborhood party, there's a new neighbor, they come up to you and say, Nick, what do you do? What's your short answer to them about what it is that you do? <laughs> so I, I've been, you know, I've been wondering about this. It's not going to be your 30-second answer, but I've been wondering <laughs> about this my, my whole life because we, we, as a team, we've gone through various iterations. And I, I'll tell you one thing that I do know, you, you mustn't say learning. Because paradoxically, as soon as you say learning, people think you mean education. Uh, in other words, you, you build e-learning courses or something, and then you're digging yourself out of a hole, the whole rest of the conversation. You're trying to say, well, I, no, I don't do that. I don't do that. So it's something about innovation, and it's something about people. Um, so I think I'd be inclined to, to say, look, I, I work in the area of innovation. Um, with, you know, with people. But more recently, um, because of the publish, publication of a book, um, I've tended to say, look, I'm a writer and I'm a consultant, you know, which, which is an opener then. They can say, well, what do you write about? You know, and, and, and what do you do? But if you just say a writer, they think you're in some attic somewhere writing novels. Um, if you say a consultant, they think, you know, you, you one down the scale from a lawyer. Um, so it, it seems like it strikes kind of the right balance. Well, th thank you for that. That's, uh, that's excellent advice, uh, not to mention learning in particular, because it does uh, put you in a particular box <laughs> in most yeah. people's minds. Um, but that's a great segue, because I wanted to talk next about your 2019 book, How People Learn. If you have a copy, uh, you may want to hold it up for <laughs> wave, our audience wave, here. Wave it, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's exactly. So they recognize the cover, and when they see it in the store or online, they'll uh, click and order it. Um, and in this, you introduce uh, the effective context model. And so I've got several questions here for you on this. But uh, so I would like you to explain this model to our audience. And then I'd like you to, to 
tell us what kind of pushback you've been giving because your model is not without some controversy, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what's the pushback that you get and what is your response to that pushback? So in three parts, what the heck is the effective context model all about? Sure. So um, the effective context model is the first general theory of learning. So it's, it's kind of odd when people see the book, and I hate the cover, by the way. I, I, my original plan was to have a banana on the cover, but the publisher said, you know, that didn't go with their brand, so we didn't get the banana. But at some point I might explain why it needs to be a banana. But the, the intent of the book, people assume that it's just yet another book where some person talks about their favorite research or the latest research in neuroscience and whatever. It's not. Um, it's something radically different from that. It attempts to introduce the first general theory of learning. She's a kind of a big ambition, I guess. But um, here's why I needed to do that. Um, as somebody who was, uh, as I say, kind of teaching various theories of learning, Bruno, Vygotsky, whatever, um, uh, classical conditioning and so on, what I began to realize was that they are a patchwork of different theories. So you could apply, for example, social learning with humans in certain contexts, but clearly not with animals. You could apply classical conditioning with animals and to some extent with humans, but it didn't account for everything. Observational learning had a place. Constructivism had a place. And what I began to realize is we're lacking a a single fundamental understanding of how memory is encoded. So there's a guy called Hebb, who in 1949, catalogued this at a neurological level. He said, look, what's going on is this. You can see, you can observe neurons under the microscope as you're moving around the world. And what happens is that neurons that fire together wire together. So somehow, and we all kind of get this, whether you're a dog or a human, your neurons are cataloging your experiences. But this begs the central question, what are they storing? Are they storing sights? Are they storing sounds? Are they storing semantics? Well, it can't be semantics. Uh, A friend of mine, uh, Roger Shank, was doing a lot of work with AI and scripts and the idea that you store everything as a schema. Well, with humans, that kind of sounds plausible, but that doesn't work so well with your cat. I mean, how's your cat storing a schema or a semantic model? So I realized that we didn't have uh, a fundamental understanding of what was going on, so I tried to put that in place. So the answer to the question is, Your neurons are storing your reactions, your emotional reactions. And as you move around the world, that is all they are storing. Whether it smells or sights or sounds or things that happen, you know, somebody gets run over or somebody spills coffee. All that your neurons are storing is your emotional reactions. And you use those emotional reactions to reconstruct in the process of memory. So this, I think, is an elegant model because it says, well, you're wired from birth to react to certain things, loud noises or or shocking things or um, injury or sickness or whatever, um, certain things, spiders. But as you develop, you have a very flexible cognitive uh, model. You can become passionate about architecture or plants, and then you'll react differently. And this accounts for many of the odd things that we see in learning and memory research, which is that different people will remember different things. So if we have a whole bunch of people going to my lecture, um, one of the things I noticed is they'll come up at the end. Different people remember different things. I well, isn't that odd? Because I only said one set of things. And sometimes they remember things that I don't even think I said. And so memory is inherently distorting. It's a model which explains it has a lot of face validity. So if you think back over your life, um, and I know this because I, I follow you on, on Facebook, Guy, <laughs> many of the things that you remember most intensely will be intense kind of emotional experience there'll be friends there'll be events and whatever um and so it it, is kind of consistent with our own experience of life is that our learning is often driven by really emotionally impactful things and it's also consistent with the work of people like elizabeth loftus as you you might know she did a lot of work into eyewitness testimony um, and found that people's memories can be distorted by the emotional significance of words like smashed or, or whatever um so The essence of the model, to summarize, is that all memory is the encoding of emotional effective responses, and we use those um, to to reconstruct um, what we recalled in the process that underpins learning. Memory's not the same as learning, but memory's a prerequisite. And I'll just finish by saying that that all sounds very abstract, but it has huge implications for for what we do in in education and what we do in learning, um, because it means you're always in one of two conditions. Either somebody really cares about something, and this is your pool condition, and this goes back to my my story about as a lecturer. People really care about stuff. They will pull content from Google. 
They will use your performance support tools and you won't need to put a lot of effective significance into them. It can just be a checklist because they care. Boy, do they care. That's when you Google something. It's like, I need to solve this problem. But in some conditions, we want to change people. People don't care about data protection or they don't care about safety. And there we have to design something which really impacts them emotionally in order to kind of change their behavior. So there we do experience design. So the practical implication of the book is that you're, you're always trying to figure out which one of those two things are we doing? Are we doing, uh, you know, performance technologies um, or are we uh, doing experience design? Um, and once you figure out which of those two things to do, you can do the thing that's going to be most effective. But you won't be able to figure that out unless you talk to people. And so that's, that's the, um, the implication is you need to do user-centered design to decide which of those, those two things you're going to do. So what, uh, what's the pushback that you uh, have been given? I'm, you know what it is yeah, because yeah, yeah, you're yeah. responding to that. So, so yeah. what are the typical issues that people raise with you? you know, what about such and such? Or you know, what are those? Yes, the biggest typical, and typically the issue is that people um, think of emotion in very crude terms. They think of emotion as kind of, you know, happy, sad. And they, and they, and they don't think that that has... Um, sufficient sophistication to give us the richness of, of learning and experience. Um, so that's the biggest problem. And that's, that's Plato and Descartes we have to thank for that, um, which is that we thought of cognition as being very sophisticated and emotional lives as being separate and quite basic. But it's not true. I mean, um, an example I sometimes use is if you can imagine the sound of a buzzing bee and the sound of a mosquito, you, you, in, you can feel you have a different emotional reaction to those things. So our emotional reactions are very subtle, a bit like our visual system. They encode a, a lot of fine detail that we're not necessarily aware of. And people like Kahneman and Ariely have been exploring this. We have a huge um, system one life where we're processing things at a high degree of complexity, but based on our instinctual responses. The other pushback I get is people conflate emotion with motivation. And they think what I'm saying is that motivation is really important to learning. That's part of it, but it's not the whole truth of it. So imagine I suddenly have a nosebleed on, on this, this interview. You'll remember that. Your viewers will. It will stick in their memories. It would be odd to say that you're motivated by nosebleeds. It's just something that humans are designed to react to. So motivations is just one small aspect of our, our reaction to things. Um, the reason I, I mentioned a banana is that I did a conference where I used it as an illustration. I, I had taped bananas on the bottom of people's seats at random. And then I said to people halfway through, now, if you've got a banana uh, taped under your seat, come and join me on stage. And we did this crazy dance with these bananas. And I said, look, the whole point of that crazy exercise was just to illustrate that will be the only thing that you remember. Um, and to, you know, Two to four years later, somebody came up to me at a conference. I couldn't, I didn't remember who it was and said, I remember you and I remember the, the banana thing that you did. Um, and so that's why I wanted the banana in the book. But, but it didn't make it onto the book now. So, uh, yeah, there we are. Thank you. Um, so um, you've covered the practical applications in what I would call training. I'm kind of old school, as you know. You've made a comment about that on Twitter, I think. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, so that's what I remember because of course it emotionally. Uh, hit me. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but yeah. I am a gray beard, so I'm fine with that. And I and I prefer the language of actually I prefer instruction as an umbrella term for everything that we do because the di the difference between training and education was a controversy since I began in the field back in 1979, and uh, it was uh, Bob Mager, in fact, who cleared it up for everybody. And I'd heard him say this several times, and this is captured on a video. He said, you already know the difference between education and training. Let's say that your daughter goes off to college and she writes back that she, because this was back in before the internet and email. And she writes back and says she's taking a sex education course. You know, it's not a big deal. But if she were to write back and say, I'm taking a sex training course, yeah, and he stopped yeah. right there and he said, see, you already know the difference. So my take on that is that training knows the performance objective of the learner or the learner slash performer, as I like to put it, because I think people, we need to think of people as performers rather than learners. And we know what their terminal performance objectives are, or we can know that by doing observations and interviews and just talking to people, as you said. 
With education, we're not sure exactly how you're going to use this, so we don't know when to stop, what to focus on, what to leave out. We just don't know. And so we're pushing content rather than allowing people to pull. And one of the things that I learned early on um, from Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert was they called what's now known as performance support, they called it guidance. Now, then Joe Harless came along and he called it job aids and Gloria Geary called it electronic performance support systems where it's embedded in the software that you're using as you kind of referred to. So this is, this is not new, this is old uh, concepts. And now that we have the ubiquitous technology, the digital tools, the smartphones, the tablets, the laptops, the desktops, we can, we can eas more easily uh, centralize the repository of these things and keep them evergreen so that they're always fresh and relevant and we can then distribute them or allow access to them allow you know we can send them out to people when they need them or they can come and get them when they need them it's you know, push pull um, so I, I liked you know this uh, resources over courses concept mm -hmm. Um, of course, unless somebody really needs to memorize something because there's going to be no time in the workflow for them to stop and refer to anything. And they may need, you know, the emergency uh, technicians uh, that respond to an accident, they need to know things. They just need to know them off the top of their head. So there's, but that's limited. And we cannot allow people to, uh, we shouldn't force people to try to memorize everything because they can't. Uh, so I really found your book uh, very interesting and very intriguing. Um, and that's what I, I wanted to talk to you about this for that particular reason. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let me segue now into the second part of that question where we introduced and talked about your book. But as a lifelong learner or practitioner, I'm not sure what to call you a learner here. That may be an insult. Um, but then you'll emotionally remember it. Um, <laughs> so what's, what's your current or next focus for learning and performing uh, so that you do things. So can you share with us anything that you're currently focused on and and are you writing about uh, these things? What can you share with us? Good questions all. Um, and if it's okay, I'm going to link back to something that you said earlier in answering that question, which is about language. And, you know, this we've been here before. And I don't want to confuse things any further because... There is other language which I think is helpful, you know, just in case learning versus sort of just in time, which I think deepens that sense of, well, you, you mentioned sort of education and training. Education is even pushing stuff in your head just in case you need to know it. A lot of what we do in kind of performance support is just in time. But I'd like to add something that I think is new and not just a rehash of those concepts. Um, the first thing is an extension of that, which is performance guidance was a, a little bit, is still in the place where, it's a bit niche. So, you know, you'll know performance guidance from your GPS in your car, performance guidance, right? So I think one of the really exciting things ahead of us, um, an answer to your question, is performance guidance for everything. So what about a leader? Where, where do you have performance guidance like GPS that says minute by minute, this would be a good thing to do now. And this would be a great time to go and talk to Bob about a creative opportunity. So we started building out systems which take a resource it's a bit like the Google Now concept for anybody who sort of remembers that and tells you just what you need to know um, at the point at which you need to know it, like GPS does, you know, turn left now. It doesn't give you the whole map. It just says this would be the best thing to do. That's a really interesting development, and that requires contextual information that we didn't have when we were developing performance support. So performance support is here's a checklist, find a, a video that, that, that you never quite know, and that's the challenge we've encountered. You, you've still got to search for it. But if the, the, the system has sufficient information, like GPS does, it can and tell you what you need to know. The second thing that I think is really interesting is that, and this is where I think some, sometimes performance consulting gets muddled, that more often than not, performance support is learning elimination. And that's a phrase that I kind of introduced to, to highlight for people that often the, the, the terms are, you know, performance technologies or performance support, performance consulting are used in the context of a learning conversation where often their net effect is to improve performance by reducing learning. Mm 
And the problem is that's an absolute anathema to people in education because their assumption is that you always improve performance by improving you know, education, putting more stuff in people's heads. But I'll, I'll give a simple example because it sounds crazy to some people. The London Underground map. I've used it for decades. It's got all the stops on there. I do not know my way around London without it. Now, I, I can bet your bottom dollar that if I didn't have that map, in a space of a few weeks, I would have started to learn the different routes because I'd have to, right? But with the map, I don't have to learn, so I don't. So it's not invariably the case, but quite often what we're creating is learning reduction mechanisms, and that's the fast track for organizations to improve performance. Uh, and so I find myself muddled up in conversations where they see performance support as a learning tool, and I'm like, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure that really is. So, so that, I think, is interesting. And the, and the last thing I would say in answer to your question, what am I looking ahead to? We're starting to think more and more about, well, the other side of things. If you're not doing performance support, if you're creating experiences like simulators, like I know you're in the military and they make heavy use of simulators because they know that's a great way to build capability. You know, you put people through the real experience in a safer environment. Um, how can we create simulators for everything? Uh, and I think VR and, and AR are going to help a lot with that. So creating simulated environments is the other kind of thing that excites me. Yes, I think that's... That goes back to, you know, how I was schooled in all of this, which was a performance orientation. We've got to understand, you know, my phrase is the performance competence, and, I, and I'm borrowing from Tom Gilbert's book title, Human Competence. But so performance competence to me is the ability to do tasks to produce outputs to all the stakeholder requirements. And so that means that your training needs to be authentic, authentic enough. It doesn't have to be yeah. exactly because yeah. it may be problematic to put somebody in the cockpit of a jet aircraft and have all the lights flashing all at once. You need to slowly, incrementally build up the amount of complexity that people have to deal with. But uh, so that's one of the things I like about what I've heard uh, you speak to on videos and what I've read is that nature of simulations because that's an that's an authentic experience and we're really preparing people for the real world application of what they know or how to use the checklist i often think about the the pilot that's inspecting the airplane before they take off they're using a checklist but that's not their first exposure to the checklist the first time they go under there and expect and inspect the belly of an aircraft there they were probably trained and put in simulations and learned, learned how to recognize mm. problems so before yeah. they take off. Um, so I think that, the, yeah, the, the what's nowadays being called learner experience or designing experiences it is, you know, and, and the sad part about all of this is that I, you know, I have a radio TV film degree and I entered into a training organization and I was just damn lucky that I got uh, this per performance orientation, um, and for my, I've been a consultant since 1982, and all of my clients, without exception, well, there's probably a few exceptions, but they were focused on topics versus tasks, which is an education model mm -hmm. versus a, a, a training or performance uh, mm -hmm. orientation. Um, and the world has not caught on to that, even though people have been talking about this. It's very interesting that you're, you're talking about people who, you know, Nigel and his book on, on uh, performance consulting, and it sounded like, oh, these are things that I learned way back when, and, and all of this is out there, and why the hell aren't people picking up on this, embracing yeah. it, and using it, and proving that it has greater impact? I, I like the comment that you made um, in some video that I looked at where you were talking about, uh, um, you know, the difference between e-learning and traditional education classroom kinds of stuff is that, uh, you know, e-learning is more effective, but given the fact that they're, that they're both not effective, that's not saying much. Um, mm. So I appreciate yeah. you sharing the message and speaking to these things uh, and uh, withering the controversy and addressing the controversy, which is, you know, really part of what I wanted to talk with you about here today. Um, so, are you are you writing? Uh, share with us how you are engaged in the social media and sharing. Because I see you on uh, mostly Twitter, less on uh, 
LinkedIn, and I s mm -hmm. see you on Facebook, of course. But uh, so, what's your intent to share, or is this? Are you, you know, championing this book <laughs> and and this model, and you're spending all your time on that? Here's a, a funny story there, which is. I used to go and speak at events. I'm, I'm a bit, I'm a theorist by heart. I, I'm a philosopher. You know, I, that's what always my passion was. And a philosopher is always interested in getting to the truth of things, the bottom of things. And that was what really drove me. And um, I don't mind getting up on stage and talking if somebody asked. So I would do these events. Uh, and then afterwards, people would come up to me and they would say, that's really interesting. You know, what, what you said there. Have you written a book? And I would say, no, but um, I published everything, I think, on blogs, and I was a very avid blogger and whatever. And, but before the words had left my mouth, I could see the disappointment, you know, register in their faces. It was like, oh, I thought you were somebody, and now I realize you are nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow, it's like, it's, I can't even give these ideas away for free. I, it's like, I have to, if for people to believe them, I have to, um, I have to have written a book. So that was part of the motivation. And I approached the publisher and I said, how about I just take my blogs and I put them in a book? And they, they laughed at me and said, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's going to work. So I, I wrote the book and now, you know, yes, you, I put it up on a slide and people think, oh, this guy really knows what he's talking about. He's written a book. And what I realized is, the, and, and your, your question about being active on social media is, is I, I sort of hate marketing. I feel like a good idea should stand on its own merits, but the real world isn't like that. And so I'm being forced to learn to do the thing that I'm weakest at, which is promoting these ideas by blogging and talking and, and, and you know, just generally marketing, I guess. And that's the reality, I think, is that you have to also be able to popularize. You know, progress is as much a, a, a beauty contest as it is a chess match. Um, and I think that that's a lesson that I, I've learned the hard way. So I don't know if I'll make progress. I'm getting on a bit now myself. So I don't know if I've got enough time to make progress left, but I'll seed a few ideas and maybe somebody who's more of a marketeer can take them, take them somewhere else. Well, I appreciate your marketing of these ideas, your sharing of these ideas. And it's, <laughs> you know, those of us who uh, I'm, I'm less, uh, concerned about this nowadays, the marketing of this, because people often think, well, you're just trying to sell. Well, no, I'm giving this stuff away for free. So, you know, take mm. it and uh, do yeah. something with it. Um, kick it around, uh, debate it, uh, try it, apply it, you know, experiment with it. And, but that's the tradition I grew up in, uh, in my professional society, people willingly shared. Yeah. And yeah, some of them wrote books about uh, about this, uh, about what they were sharing, and others just you know didn't write books, maybe wrote articles and things like that. But so I appreciate that. And I don't think you're looking that all that old anyway. So uh, I think you've got time to uh, continue the good fight. Um, <clears throat> so we we've touched on, a little bit on language. So my next question, uh, let me set it up. It, it's a, is I'm looking for a favorite, or perhaps it's not a favorite performance improvement or learning or whatever term or phrase that you would perhaps define for us. Okay. I think we're good now. <laughs> yeah. um, Sorry, I'm so, just, um, the, Apple, the Apple in their wisdom have uh, put the charger and the external thing on the same port. So it's, I just realized it's low on battery. So hopefully we won't die and hopefully you can still hear me. I can hear you just fine. So I think we're good, but uh, yes, yeah, so the technology <clears throat> It's interesting. Yeah. Um, so, so what I'm looking for is uh, some term or phrase that perhaps you're unhappy with how it's being defined or it's being misconstrued by, by people listening to it. Or So do, do you have a phrase or a term that you would define for us? Sure. Uh, and I'd love to. And actually, I, I suppose it caused a, a, a bit of a, a storm in a teacup recently. Um, with a post around the difference between learning capital L and learning small L. Um, and I was trying to draw a distinction, I think, similar to the one that you were describing, where I keep finding myself in conversations where um, learning, as, as people talk about it, and you might be in a, a learning event or talking about a system, is basically conceived as topic-centric. It's all about how can we get these topics across to these people? So they'll say we need a learning program or a learning management system. And the basic function of those 
is always may not be expressed explicitly is to push more topics more content and that to me is education and so all of those kinds of systems learning management systems are not learning management systems they're education systems they're there to you know push stuff in so you can pass a test and a lot of learning conferences you rock up and people are actually talking about the same thing they're just talking about how can we push more more topics out of people more efficient short videos and whatever and so I get a bit frustrated with this, so I ended up saying, look, you, you guys, you're talking about education, and you're calling it learning, but learning is something else. Learning with a small L is, you know, a, a pool process. It's the process by which people every day in little ways get what they need to help them with the contexts that they're facing, with the tasks that, that they're challenged by. You and I do it. I mean, I'm learning about things on a minute-by-minute -minute basis using whatever is to hand, people, devices, and so on. And that's driven by my challenges. So um, I was just trying to highlight that learning with a capital L is education. It's about topics and about pushing content. And learning with a small L is about the person, the individual, and what they're challenged by and the resources and, and, and the stuff that they use to, to tackle those challenges. Um, and they're, they're very, very different things. You know, you can go to a learning conference and nobody will talk about learning small L the whole time. And, and I feel like that has to change, really, if we're going to make progress in the industry. Yes, and there are people who are proponents of learning with a small L and supporting and enabling people's challenges, whether they're at, on, at work or whether they're at home, etc. So thank you for sharing that. All right, let's switch gears again. And what I'd like to have you do for us now is share some stories. I know you're big into stories. Uh, so you may have some stories of others. And again, this is to help point people to other people as resources, as somebody to learn from small L. Um, and uh, so you mentioned a couple people before we started, and you also have some additional stories. That, so uh, let's just open it up here and uh, uh, perhaps start with some of the your choice, your stories or stories of uh, that involve others. Sure. There, well, there are, there are a couple of, um, of stories I can tell. I was sort of um, so uh, some of the people. It can feel very lonely, actually. Frankly, working against the convention, the educational machine, the the bureaucracy, as I call it, which is is very much kind of self sustaining. But as people are starting to recognise, it's not impacting people and performance in the way we'd like. But once you step out of that, you can feel, you know, in, out in the cold. So there have been people who have been really helpful to me. Uh, Roger Shanker, Professor Roger Shanker, uh, I think formerly was at Yale, who is a, a guy with an incredible track record. I used to teach his stuff as a psychology lecturer when he did, together with um, Professor Abelson, some work on scripts and AI, which is all about really understanding what was going on in people's heads and was some of the sort of pioneering world work in that in that field and then he moved into um he founded a company to do learning and he wrote a book called designing world-class e-learning which is still one of the better books that you can read um when I, back when i was at siemens i was giving it to the team and basically he was saying stop doing all this ridiculous stuff and and the terrifying thing is that now you know probably almost 30 years on from that point he's still staying stop doing this ridiculous stuff and it, it's it's almost it's a juggernaut it almost seems sort of un, unstoppable um so it, that was very helpful somebody else was very helpful was um a guy called dr itiel draw um who is a, a cognitive scientist um and does quite a lot of work in the area of learning he was speaking at learning technologies um and he is arguing from the perspective of cognitive science and the research about just how important it is that learning considers this kind of emotional um, element. And he uses a lovely story of how he taught his kids um, not to open the door to strangers. And he said, look, you know, I, I would tell them several times, don't open the door to strangers. But then what I would do is I would sneak out. Um, I would dress up in a beard and, you know, some sort of scary sort of mask, bang on the door and say, let me in, let me in, let me in. Um, and the kids would eventually open the door and then he would then scare the life out of them <laughs> and say, what did I tell you? <laughs> from the Lord of Strangers. And so it was a nice illustration of just how um, impactful and he works in a number of fields where it's really important that people uh, develop. And then there are other stories, I guess, about my own um, uh, experience of, of applying with thinking. I worked with 
um, somebody in BP, and they had designed a virtual induction program. Uh, and they made the mistake of asking me um, to be uh, on the pilot for this program. Uh, and so I was super excited by this. So I thought, wow, you know, you're using a virtual environment for induction. What are we going to be doing? Are we going to be chasing around in three dimensions? Are we going to be tackling some problem? And to my horror, when I joined this this virtual um, session, they'd recreated a classroom. And so they'd taken the 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 absolute freedom of a digital environment and recreated the convention that, that we we know and hate. And so we all had to sit in a semicircle in virtual chairs looking at somebody with a, a virtual flip chart. I was thinking, this is madness. And I was typing away on chat to people, what do you think of this? Do you not think there's a better way of using this technology? And I was told to shut up, you know, because it's distracting. <laughs> we, you know, we weren't, weren't able to have a conversation. And then I'm a bit of a nuisance. Um, and so I right clicked on the, the flip chart in this virtual environment. And um, it was displaying a PowerPoint slide. And I thought, I wonder what else we could be doing here. And it had a little option, a right click option that said upload media. So I had this picture on my hard drive of this frightening squirrel. So I uploaded this picture of the frightening squirrel. And, and the, <laughs> the PowerPoint slide disappeared. And the bullet points were gone. And we were all sat there staring at this picture of a squirrel. And I thought, Oh, I wonder if it's just me that's seeing it. And, and, then the, and then the facilitator stopped talking, and then they and then they couldn't figure out how to re-upload the original PowerPoint. So they had to cancel the whole pilot. And I was not popular. And I was not invited back onto the onto the next version of it. But it, you know, it was it was interesting as an illustration to me of how it, the technology can be pointless if we just carry the same thinking into. You know, we implement the, the same bad ideas into kind of new technology. Um, so that was a, an interesting story. Um, and then there were there were stories of people I worked with, a lady called Gemma Critchley, who now is, I think, head of learning at Legal in General. Uh, and I recruited her from a marketing background. And she was bemused as to why I would want somebody in an L&D team. She was doing digital marketing. And I, I was saying, no, no, these are the skills. You already have the skills we need. You understand audiences. You understand content strategy. You understand iterative design and, and what it means to, you know, to use analytics to really understand what's working and what isn't. Uh, and so that was a, a really helpful relationship. Um, um, and another lady called Barbara Thompson, I think, is doing great stuff as well, who brought lots of consumer thinking into what we were doing with, um, with learning. Uh, and a young guy called Charlie Neen, I think he was just gone independent. He, he came from an events management background. Um, and so he was really clued up on what it takes to to organize a really impactful event. And, and I said, well, that's that's what we need. We need somebody who's thinking that way, but can just apply it to learning. Mm. So I had a lot of luck, really, apply, finding great people in other disciplines um, and bringing them in to, to learning to see what they could do. Excellent. Thank you. I, I love the story about that pilot session. I always refer to pilot sessions as a full destructive test. If we can break it, let's yeah. do it. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah. that's, what, yeah. that's what you did. You broke it. I was supposed to rubber stamp it, though. I didn't. You see, I'm not very socially adept, clearly, and, and I didn't quite get that that was my role, just to give it the nod. You know. Uh, let me ask a question. That going back to the top of our interview here, you talked about your firm, uh, PA Consulting, and soon to be Deloitte. Is that what you yeah. said? Yeah, in March, I, I move uh, across to Deloitte. So, yeah, yeah. And are you going to stay with the company and, and be a part of Deloitte then? I am. So I'm going, moving up as a, a director of um, uh, L&D for, I think, UK and Northern Europe. I think there's a team of about 100 people there. Um, so knowledge, um, transfer knowledge exchange is really, obviously really important for uh, uh, consultancy. And so one of the, the things that appeals is they place a lot of emphasis on getting that right. And they're really trying to do, you know, cutting edge stuff that works. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'll get the opportunity to do more of that. That's uh, excellent. So I'll, I'll, I'll be looking forward to see uh, what the impact you have there. Um, so as a way to begin a wrap up of our interview here, my final question is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially people new to the field, whether they're young or middle-aged or older, but people who are entering into this world of learning and development or training and development or instruction? 
uh, for performance improvement, performance impact, what guidance can you share with them, for them? Okay, well, it, it won't be necessarily the guidance um, that they might expect or you might expect me to say. I would say simply that we're children on the beach. Um, I don't know if you spent much time playing with kids on the beach. Uh, I certainly did growing up. And you go there and you build your sand castles and you put the shells on them and you get some seaweed and then the tide washes them away. And one of the things as I've got older, I realized that all of our projects are like that. You know, we get super excited about, you know, building this, building that. Um, and then somebody comes along and, and knocks it down. And I've realized you make a bit of a fool of yourself if you, you get too caught up um, in the particular projects um, and actually not playing nicely. Um, and what I've learned is that the real legacy, the real reason you're there playing on the beach is not to build sandcastles, but is to build memories. Um, and so when I think back on the projects that I've enjoyed, it's been for that reason, is that we did wonderful, fun, exciting stuff together. And sometimes it works perfectly and sometimes it doesn't. Whatever you do, it's going to get washed away on the next tide. But what will never go are the memories of a, a really great day. Um, so that's my perspective now on all of this. Um, it, it will all go away. It will all turn around. Something will happen. Things will change. Um, but you know, if, if we played nicely together, I think that's the more important thing. Now I'm wondering what the emotional hook was because instantly I thought of a Jimi Hendrix song, Castles Made of Sand, and I'm going to have to go listen to that as soon as we're done. <laughs> um, Nick Shackleton Jones, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights uh, controversial though they may be, uh, right on, brother. Um, thank you so much. Uh, have a great day. Thank you, guys.